I'm Song Richardson, and I'm the Dean of UCI Law. And we are very proud to be participating in this Teach-In for Racial Justice as part of the Scholar Strike. We believe that it's more important than ever for scholars to grapple with issues of racial justice, the role that the law has played and continues to play in supporting anti-Blackness and racism, and also that the role that the law has played and continues to play and help to dismantle it. So today we have four faculty who will share some of their thoughts on racial equity in their areas of expertise. And they'll speak in alphabetical order and let me introduce them that way. I won't give long introductions, I'll just tell you who they are. So first we have Professor and Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Mersa Baradaran. She'll be speaking first. And then speaking second will be Chancellor's Professor of Law, Dan Burke. Third will be Distinguished Professor of Law, Joe Demento. And finally will be Professor Dalie Jimenez. So thank you once again for joining us and I will turn this over to Professor Baradaran. Um, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I uh, I will be quick because I uh, there's so much uh, 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 other so many other um, topics to cover. I um I decided only because uh, we were focusing on this um, today in my property class that I would talk a little bit about um, how the law shaped. Um, the law of property and um, zoning uh, through uh, contracts and through um, uh, racial covenants and uh, through just uh, uh, sort of legislative practice. So I'm going to share just a few um, slides here and see if I um, can do that. Um, yes, you can. You can see this, correct? Okay, so uh, the New Deal is uh, commonly sort of associated with having created the middle class. When we talk about, you know, quote unquote, make America great again, people are talking about the sort of, you know, suburban life of the simple 1950s and 1960s. And and the, the New Deal didn't just give um, uh, give uh, uh, um, uh, the middle middle class Americans a uh, you know mortgage. What it did was create a class of middle-class Americans um, uh, through a mortgage credit and consumer credit system. And so the, the New Deal, um, um, someone requested annotating of the things, so I don't know who that is, but I'm just gonna turn it off. Um, okay, so the New Deal, um, what they did was um, do uh, go through the HOLC and the New Deal map makers and zoned and, uh, determined where neighborhoods fell based on the level of risk and whether the houses would appreciate or not. So this is uh, Chicago and you can see in the green neighborhoods were where mortgages were given um, and guaranteed by the FHA um, and insured by the government, which meant that they were low risk and that they would be uh, abundant. Um, in the red zone, mortgages were not allowed um, and were not uh, able to be guaranteed by the FHA and thereby there were no mortgages in that area. And the number one thing used by these um, uh, uh, surveyors was race. So if you look at this map, this is um, Atlanta, Georgia, and that neighborhood on the right there on the screen, or I don't know what screen it is, it's on the right of mine, um, is the best, uh, you know, as it says, actually the best, uh, uh, you, you can look at the top, the best uh, Negro neighborhood in the country, okay? Um, why? It was because it was where Spelman and Morehouse was. It was, as you can see, Atlanta University, schools, parks, the the homes were owned. This, in any other area, it would have been um, a very desirable area. And it says that it is so. But if you look at the, the number two, which is the prime indicator that they use to, to um, do these uh, map, mapping zones, it says um, foreign-born families, what percentage, and then what percentage Black and then infiltration of, okay? So how close were, um, you know, black communities from coming into that area? And so, so what this created was, um, you know, harsh lines of segregation. So, so this area, I should uh, then finish the loop here. It was redlined, as you can see. So no mortgages were allowed in this area. And these maps last a long time and they create a white suburban wealth building uh, community out in the green areas and in the red areas, there's no mortgages, there's installment credit, which is really high debt and, um, and they're not 
uh, able to build wealth because there's no private or public capital um, at all in these mortgages because th there's no government guarantees. Um, so the, the the lines of the neighborhoods were not only done by you know realtors and developers who would create these walls and zones and signs like this. And not only was it driven by you know racism, but it was also driven by property values because property values are now embedded in the race of the people in that neighborhood. Um, and they were also uh, driven by lawyers. So first it was violence and mobs and signs and uh, all of that. And then it be the lawyers came in and put in racial restrictions. So you can see this is a classic uh, racial covenant. Uh, it says, um, no property in said addition be sold, conveyed, or leased, or in whole or, whole or in part to any persons or persons not of the white or Caucasian race. No person other than one of the white or Caucasian race shall be permitted to occupy. Um, uh, every house uh, built in between 1934 when the FHA was uh, uh, issued until 1968, and sometimes thereafter when uh, a case called Kramer, uh, Shelley versus Kramer um, in the Supreme Court said that these were not enforceable, had these. And it, it was in fact malpractice not to include uh, a racial zoning uh, guidance. Here's another one here. Um, in any of uh, the houses sold, because then you would uh, allow a few black families to move in and the, the housing costs would diminish. This These are now um, imposed by, um, so I'm going to stop sharing and finish up. Um, uh, uh, these are now, uh, um, they have gone away, the racial covenants, but they are um, now imposed through zoning. Uh, the, the class I'm teaching later on in property today talks about how zoning actually um, recreates some of these patterns. And so if we're going to take um, anti-racism, specifically anti-black racism seriously, we have to take account of what our profession um, through the laws of property, zoning, contract, uh, legislative uh, construction and statutory interpretation, what we have done to uh, abet uh, white supremacy and embed white supremacy in um, housing values and other um, credit uh, uh, apparatus. Um, so I will pass the time on to my colleagues. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, I'm Dan Burke, and I'm going to continue uh, some of the themes that Professor Baradaran has, has uh, already brought up. Um, uh, this is a sort of a smorgasbord session. We've got several faculty from uh, UC Irvine uh, talking about uh, different areas of the law. And, and one of the takeaways for me from, from this kind of a session and from the teaching as a whole uh, is that uh, if, if racism is pervasive, which, which it, it clearly is, um, then we have to deal with it across the curriculum. We have to deal with it pervasively uh, throughout the law school curriculum. Uh, so I want to continue the, the property theme a little bit, but focus on my area of intellectual property, uh, where I've been told by, you know, by some people a little incredulously, uh, say, well, you know, that's, that doesn't seem to be something that's uh, about discrimination or, or racism. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like, uh, like uh, you know, employment law or voting rights or something where race would come up. Um, and, and it's true that until recently, uh, there really wasn't much focus in, in this area on uh, questions of racism. But I think one of the takeaways from uh, today, one of the takeaways from the teaching is that if you haven't found racism in a particular area of the law, it's because you haven't looked hard enough yet. Right? Um, so we're beginning uh, to have some really great scholarship that is teasing out these issues. Uh, for example, in the copyright area, uh, we have some some scholarship by African American scholars talking about how the copyright system, uh, which is supposed to protect uh, artists and and musicians, um, has has not dealt very fairly with uh, African American artists in particular. If you think about uh, jazz musicians or hip hop musicians, uh, there's some great work about how the copyright system has uh, led to the exploitation of some of these artists. Um, we also have some empirical work indicating that. Uh, the number of uh, underrepresented minorities and particularly the number of African-American um, artists who have registered their copyrights with the Copyright Office, um, that that is much less than you would expect given the, the, the population, uh, the percentage of these people in the population. So uh, since you have to register your copyright before you can enforce your copyright, that again means that these uh, uh, artists are not getting the full benefits of the system. Um, in the trademark area, area dealing with uh, logos and, and symbols that uh, indicate to consumers uh, the origin of goods, uh, there's uh, been uh, an increasing amount of focus on problems uh, related, for example, to uh, demeaning or stereotypical 
uh, trademarks, uh, for example, with sports teams, uh, ongoing controversy regarding uh, the Washington Redskins and, and other uh, depictions of Native Americans. Um, there's, uh, we've also seen since the, since the murder of uh, George Floyd, uh, some major trademark holders withdrawing some uh, stereotypical and demeaning trademarks. Uh, for example, the, the Aunt Jemima trademark, uh, Uncle Ben, uh, and the anonymous chef on the, sh on the uh, box of cream of wheat, uh, those are all being withdrawn. Um, so when you start looking in these areas, you, you find the racial uh, overtones uh, and racial problems pretty quickly. But I want to focus the few minutes I have left on, uh, on the area of patent law, uh, where there's been less work, but it's starting to, to be done, and it's, it's very evocative. Again, people have said to me, well, that doesn't seem like an area that would really have a lot of uh, racial problems. Uh, you know, it's about inventions and technology and, and new innovation. Um, uh, but again, that's something we need to look at a little more carefully. Uh, we know, for example, from recent empirical work, uh, that the number of black inventors, right, the number of African Americans who've applied for patent from the patent office um, is, uh, is very small. It's, it's almost vanishingly small. Um, uh, the same is true, by the way, for other uh, underrepresented minorities and, and for women, right? The number of women who apply for uh, patents in the U.S. patent office is, is uh, less than 12%, right? So, so much less than 50%, which you might expect. Um, and uh, when you point that out, people will typically say, well, that must be because we don't have enough uh, uh, underrepresented minorities, we don't have enough women, don't have enough African Americans uh, in science and engineering. You know, as we help people uh, move into the STEM areas, science, technology, engineering, and, and math, as they move into those areas uh, um, more fully, then maybe we'll get more patents uh, from people working in those areas. Uh, and certainly that's a very desirable goal to make certain that everyone can participate uh, in, the, in the STEM uh, 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 domain, but uh, that doesn't explain everything that's going on there, right? Um, and we're starting to, to get some really good historical work, kind of going back to the theme uh, Professor Baradaran raised of, of, of looking at history. Um, we're getting some good historical work that indicates how we ended up where we are, right? So if you go back uh, before the Civil War, um, uh, we find that uh, uh, where you had African-American slaves who invented things, and they did because they were very inventive and creative, um, uh, frequently uh, they don't show up in the record because uh, the slaveholder would file a patent uh, on the invention. Uh, you know, you have kind of the paradox of a person being treated as property and can property own property, including intellectual property, uh, and the answer seemed to be no. So, for example, we uh, are pretty sure uh, we have increasing evidence that Eli Whitney did not invent the cotton gin. Uh, we're pretty sure that his slaves invented the cotton gin, uh, which makes sense if you think about it. They were tasked with picking the seeds out of the cotton that they were required to harvest, and that was a very tedious and difficult task. And so being uh, inventive people, they developed a machine that would make their work easier uh, and had kind of the ironic outcome of making cotton more valuable and increasing the slave trade. Um, uh, in the North, right, where you had uh, uh, free black citizens, um, again, it was not considered to be proper or permissible uh, for uh, an African-American inventor to apply for a patent. There would be pushback from the community. There would be pushback from the patent office. Uh, and so frequently they would try and find uh, a white uh, business partner, sometimes who would finance the invention and who would uh, put their name on the patent application and it would go through the patent office much faster and more easily then. Um, uh, by the way, this also happened with women. It was not considered proper for women to be inventors, uh, particularly un under coverture where a woman couldn't hold property and couldn't enter into contracts. Um, so frequently you would find the names of uh, a husband or a father since uh, depending on the marital status of the woman, she was kind of the property of the husband or the father anyway. Um, so this is a, you know, this, this is a generalized problem for subordinated or, uh, or oppressed groups. Um, uh, after the Civil War, um, uh, we start to see, um, uh, based on some historical work that's been done recently, um, African-American inventors applying for patents at about the rate that you would hope for, right? About the same uh, um, percentage as you would find African-Americans in the general population. Um, and that suddenly stopped around 1900, uh, right around the turn of the last century. And some, again, recent work has shown that that coincided with a series of high-profile lynchings of uh, African-American inventors. Right? If you can imagine 
Uh, you have a black inventor in a small town or rural town in, uh, in America in 1900. They apply for and receive a patent. Uh, and that means that a very fancy document is sent to them from Washington, D.C. It has a ribbon and a big red seal on it. Um, and, uh, and the message of this racial violence was, you know, don't get above your station. You know, you, you shouldn't be uh, interacting with these agencies in Washington, D.C. So th that message was received. Uh, and and uh, black inventor application has dropped to zero. It's never recovered since then, right? Um, so there's a there's a history there, and you might say, well, that was a long time ago, right? You know, the, no one is gonna gonna kill a black inventor now, right? Um, but we still have that legacy embedded in the system. So uh, we've got some good, uh, very good recent empirical work showing um, that uh, when African American inventors do apply for patents. Um, they're less likely to have the patent issue statistically significantly. Uh, they're more likely to end up with a narrow or weaker patent because of resistance from the patent office. Um, you might be aware of some of the work that's been done on implicit bias with resumes where you take two identical resumes. Uh, you put a kind of a generic name on one and you put a name on another one that might be associated with a black or African American community um, and you have those reviewed. Uh, and it turns out that the African American name or associated name uh, gets less interviews, gets less attention. The same thing appears to have been going on in the patent office, right? There's a very similar kind of implicit bias problem we think now in the patent office. By the way, again, that's also true for female inventors. Female inventors, we have good, good evidence, are less likely to get a patent, less likely to, to get a strong patent uh, because of bias uh, among patent examiners and in the patent office. Um, so uh, having more scientists and engineers from underrepresented groups would be great, uh, but that's not going to solve the problem that we have in the patent system. We've got to actually go into the institutions, uh, change some attitudes and change some uh, practices within the, the legal institutions that exist. Um, so uh, I think three takeaways from this. Uh, number one, uh, which is, uh, you know, you, you can't solve the problem until you know what the problem is. Uh, it's not enough just to have more scientists and engineers from underrepresented groups. Uh, the problem is a little bit different, and we're starting to understand what that problem is. Um, uh, number two, uh, if you think you can find an area of law that has no uh, racial problems or racial overtones, uh, that probably means that you haven't looked hard enough yet. Uh, you need to do a little bit more digging, which is what we're now doing in intellectual property. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, that uh, you know the law is very important in changing uh, its own institutions and its own practices, as Professor Barada uh, said. Um, and now that we have a better sense of, of, of what that is by having looked at the history, uh, we're better able to solve the problem. Uh, and so thank you for your attention, and I will turn the time over to Professor Demento. Thanks. I'm very pleased to be involved in this teaching. It's very exciting to, for me. And uh, Michael, if you could show the first slide. I've already learned a lot uh, even in these 10 minutes and the other uh, parts of the teaching I've watched. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Dan said, we're looking uh, into our particular fields to see um, are we um, cognizant of, sufficiently cognizant of the extent to which law has perpetrated racism and the extent to which law can be a part of the solution. In my um, field of law, which is uh, development control, land use, and property, uh, it's very easy to find uh, very problematic and serious uh, examples of racism. It's a shameful history. Uh, one, the quote on the screen, we didn't get here by accident, uh, relates to a, a video I'll refer you to later in, in this short presentation. But it is true, uh, the racial situation here was not by accident, it was by plan by certain people. Uh, but I will end on a somewhat uh, positive tone because I think there we're finding Increasingly, we're finding ways of using the law to turn things around to improve the situation. This book on the right, The Color of Law, uh, published by a, a, a Berkeley professor a couple of years ago, is moved to the top of uh, some uh, publishers list. And it, it's a very good overview of um, many more issues in the law and racism than I could 
cover today. Next slide, please. Uh, the early zoning ordinances, my course starts with this, and uh, uh, I learn more every time I teach this course, and I'm learning more with the new focuses that we're bringing to the table uh, uh, in these uh, months, uh, the early zoning ordinances were explicitly racial and, and the regulations um, following them, no Chinese la uh, laundry. So uh, many of you know about this. Uh, some of them uh, were explicitly racial against uh, African-Americans with the zoning ordinances saying whites only and blacks only. Uh, those uh, those documents, uh, so in some cases, are not no longer available, but they did exist. Many of the zoning ordinances, however, were more insidious because it was the impact on um, on the rights and property rights and lives of Black Americans that were affected. Uh, next slide, please. One of the elements of uh, zoning law, and I've written too much about it, is the relationship to planning. And planning is sometimes seen as a benign, uh, neutral uh, um, vessel in which you put um, good ideas and, and then try to implement them. Well, uh, the more you look into comprehensive planning, you see some uh, jurisdictions where because zoning itself was no longer constitutional to um, be explicitly racist, that code words were used in comprehensive or master plans that realized some of the same goals as uh, the restrictive zoning ordinances were. Uh, the restrictive covenants, uh, issue in uh, the uh, in the private sector uh, of course uh, we all know about it and um, as uh, explained that in the first presentation uh, redlining was uh, a precursor to that where uh, er areas were literally circled in red and uh, no um, uh, no uh, loan should be uh, um, made available in those uh, situations. Further on housing, uh, the whole focus on affordability and discrimination in housing uh, is a major area in which uh, uh, racial discrimination has been uh, reflected. More the, the more we look into this, the more we see also that it's amenable to various interpretations. We could talk about this in the um, question and answer period. What is state action? Uh, discrimination uh, in certain uh, major judicial opinions is, is only unconstitutional if uh, de jure. But state action in many of these cases uh, is in the background throughout the development of, uh, of public policy. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like also to very briefly talk about contemporary topics. Uh, the zoning and planning history is one uh, that has too many examples of, uh, of discrimination. But in a contemporary uh, focus, we see this in more subtle ways. Uh, uh, access to who gets to make the law and who gets to implement the law. Again, I could pick up on that. But with regard to some physical uh, areas of land use and development control, uh, what is done in uh, the areas of transportation and transit oftentimes has a very significant negative impact on people of color and um, non underrepresented people. One of uh, my strong interests is how did we decide to put urban freeways through the 15th Ward where, uh, next to which I lived in upstate New York? I lived there. I didn't go there because Syracuse was heavily segregated at the time. How are we uh, in a situation where massive billions of uh, public monies are going into transportation systems that uh, that are beautiful and sleek and serve uh, 
very uh, limited uh, areas of urban uh, of the urban landscape. We see this though in 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 fairly mundane activities like where do the cannabis facilities get uh, uh, get cited? Uh, and uh, there is a new text out on cannabis law that uh, underscores the the, uh, the reality that cannabis is used by many, uh, but cannabis facilities should be cited in areas that uh, are not in my backyard. Then the whole area of gentrification, which is extraordinarily complex. Uh, what is the cause and what is the effect? But there are certainly some very significant uh, uh, negative impacts on uh, communities of color here. Next slide, please. Climate change and race. Uh, this article in the New York Times, which I don't know if you'll have access to uh, the slides, but uh, 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 it is easily accessible, uh, uh, linking uh, the redlining of, um, of, of property uh, uh, to uh, the nature of uh, the temperature problems associated with, uh, with living in urban areas. And it was dramatic to me. I, I'm a big climate change guy and study it a lot. And the extent to which the, the temperature increases in areas that were redlined associated with the fact that there are fewer parks there, there are less, um, uh, there's less foliage there. Uh, it's, a, it's an extraordinary impact. And this story, so well done, uh, traces the lives of a black family who make a walk through very hot city uh, to get to uh, park areas where uh, the temperatures are much more uh, um, bearable. Uh, next slide, please. Nothing, sadly, could be more contemporary than the relationship between uh, land use and development control and uh, the terrible pandemic we're living through. Uh, the LA Times did an extremely good assessment based on demographic data of the extent to which coronavirus incidence is so much higher in areas where uh, less, uh, uh, African Americans and uh, Hispanic Americans live. They are near areas that uh, are um, zoned for industrial use, that being one element of the incidence, but they also have uh, less access to affordable uh, housing and housing that is um, uh, that is capable of uh, meeting the, their family needs. Um, so and, and of course, the relationship between uh, coronavirus spread and homelessness. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the picture uh, on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. What can we do be done? So the history and contemporary uh, practice is uh, quite discouraging at times. There's a lot to be done and a lot that is being done, including at our, our own law school. I'm not a clinician, but the clinical programs here have been extraordinary in their uh, work in the field, helping uh, to address many of these issues. What I am is a multidisciplinary uh, researcher and pushing for deeper analysis of, of uh, relationships that we've taken for granted uh, is very important. Um, there has been very good recent work on race, ethnicity, and discriminatory zoning that goes into the causal links between. It's not just correlation. Uh, and uh, uh, that is something that I think is an important part of our our educational mission. Of course, uh, public interest volunteer work. Uh, again, UC Irvine is, uh, is, is the leader in that field. A little, the next bullet point is a little bit sensitive. Um, 
what what parts of these talks aren't, but uh, our own voting and encouraging people to vote, but digging in deeper on the candidates and uh, what are their um, what are their true platforms. Uh, yes, I'm for inclusionary housing, but I cannot buy into this new law introduced by uh, Senator Weiner or the more recent law in California that would allow for um, additional housing on single home zoned uh, plots. Um, that we can't quite accept. Uh, and there are so many reasons that people who are saying that they are for affordable housing um, uh, that aggregate to them being against affordable housing. And then finally, and I, as I said at the beginning, I'm learning so much from teaching this course probably for the 800th time with uh, some active interest in new perspectives, learning, learning from each other, including from our students. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yesterday, we uh, talked about some of these issues in the teach-in, and I asked students, uh, if you have any thoughts, here's a time to share them. Uh, send me a message. And I got this message. You can see it, dear Professor Domeno. I wanted to follow up about the class area er, uh, earlier. There is a disconnect between many typically white liberals who profess otherwise progressive values, but ignore those values when it comes to their own behavior with regard to local land use specifically building more affordable housing. You asked that I think about that issue, uh, a million dollar question. But to a certain degree, I think um, you sh it has to be addressed even though it, some of the points can be sensitive. Someone who believes they are part of the solution, and he was referring to uh, white uh, liberals, um, will never welcome someone else suggesting they are part of the problem. And uh, he walked through some of the arguments that uh, are made. Yes, I'm for affordable housing, but not that bill. And of course, not in this part of the coastal community, but we'll give money to those who are, are, are moving uh, in the direction of citing uh, affordable housing inland or elsewhere. And he goes through the arguments of uh, safety, uh, the kind of people that we want in the neighborhood. And he, he links that to a recent uh, uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by President Trump and, and Ben Carson. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then he goes on to address, uh, I understand these, but I don't agree with all of them. And he goes through it. And this was particularly, the second paragraph I thought was particularly um, um, interesting and compelling. I think the economic argument about protecting economic uh, housing um, can be flipped in a morally compelling way. The individual admits the economic value of their home. That individual, some way or another, acquired the home and wants to protect the home as an investment. But the same system that allowed that person to be in that position kept other people out of it because of race. I think the history here could be helpful. The generational damage caused uh, by redlining or other forms of housing discrimination. The lack of value of a home in a discriminated area and the inability of residents in that area to use that home as equity. Uh, last slide, please. I think it can be argued that the safety and what kind of people do you, uh, okay, finally on the argument about losing certain comforts, and, and this was quite compelling. I think the argument and response can simply be, this is the cost of racial justice. So the risk of having to fend harder for a street parking space outweigh being a part of the community that takes a concrete step to advance racial justice. Uh, so I don't agree with some of the um, causal links he makes in this uh, very articulate uh, comment to me, but I, I found it very inspiring. Last slide, please. 
I really appreciate having been involved in this, and uh, I'm reinvigorated to go deeper in my uh, courses on these issues. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I hear myself. Is anyone? We can hear you. Yeah, I just hear myself talking, which is disturbing. <laughs> I'm gonna just, uh, I don't know how else to do it. I'm just gonna lower my own volume. Okay, so if I, if somebody needs to talk, just chat or something, because I won't be able to hear you. Um, okay, hi, uh, I'm Dalia Jimenez. I, um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here um, and to tell you a little bit about an article uh, that I wrote with um, uh, Professor Jonathan Glader, now at UCLA Law, formerly here at UC Irvine, um, and, uh, and Judine Richardson uh, and the University of Cincinnati Law for, um, for uh, the opportunity to be here, and to all of you. Um, so I run the Student Loan Law Initiative at UCI Law, um, which is an academic center dedicated to producing high quality academic research on the student loan crisis. So what I'm gonna tell you about today is about uh, the student loan crisis. And it's an article that was, um, I think it's already published. Uh, it should be already uh, in print. I don't know if it's available uh, on the internet, but here's the link to the SSRN page. Um, and it's entitled Student Debt is a Civil Rights Issue, the Case for Debt Relief and Higher Education Reform. Um, we know we have a severe racial wealth gap in the United States uh, through work like Professor Baradaran's books and those uh, the work mentioned actually uh, by both Professor Burke and uh, Demento a few minutes ago. We also know how much of that wealth gap was created and exacerbated by sometimes outright racist legislative choices. Uh, the legislative choice to decide to fund uh, higher education primarily by uh, making debt loans available to students was probably not um, an outright racist one, uh, but it is one that certainly has had a disproportionately harmful effect on uh, certain racial groups, particularly Black and Latino students, also Native and some Asian uh, groups, but we have so much less data about them that it is, uh, we actually have terrible data here in general, um, but it is uh, particularly hard to talk about numbers um, in those groups, so I'll focus on Black and Latino students. So uh, while federal student debt doesn't operate by discriminating explicitly on the basis of race, uh, for instance, the terms do not vary with any kind of uh, racial or um, other identity markers, nor uh, are, uh, are borrowers of particular groups more or less likely to uh, be granted or denied uh, federal debt since it's available, federal student debt, since it's available basically to anyone so long as they fill out the um, federal application for student uh, financial aid. Um, which is has its own barriers. Uh, but we're all familiar by now with how often facially neutral laws can turn out to have a disparate impact on communities of color and in particular black communities, um, given our history. Uh, in fact, student debt is the paradigmatic example of what um, sociologists Louis Seamster and Raphael uh, Sharon Chenier have uh, termed predatory inclusion, uh, which they call or they um, define as a process whereby members of a marginalized group are provided with access to a good service or opportunity in which, from which they have been historically excluded, but under conditions, they're provided that access under conditions that jeopardize the benefits of that access. And that's exactly what we have here. You can't talk about the $1.6 trillion in outstanding student debt without talking about race. Um, and that is because people of color, especially Black, Latinx, Native, and some groups of Asian American students and their families are disproportionately harmed by this debt. Um, our higher education policy choices have put students of color further behind than they were already. For example, black students are disproportionately likely to borrow. They borrow larger amounts. They're more likely to take out student loans to attend for-profit schools with worse career outcomes and more often default on their loans than their white peers. In fact, 12 years after enrolling, the median black student borrower owes 13% more on their federal loans than they initially borrowed. So they owe 113% um, of their initial uh, loan, whether or not they graduated. The median Latinx borrower owes 83% of what they initially borrowed. And in contrast, the median white student owes 60% of the initial loan. All of those are ridiculous numbers. This is 13 years after graduate, after enrolling. I mean, for every single group, that those are 60% as the lowest but then 60 compared to 113 
um, you know, is, is quite dramatic. Both Latinx and uh, Black students are less likely to complete a course of study than our white students, which significantly impacts, obviously, their ability to repay loans, also um, bias in the labor markets, uh, and just the lesser wealth also significantly impacts their ability to uh, repay loans. There's also some evidence of bias in uh, servicing uh, and federal servicing, which is done by private contractors. Um, so overall, getting a degree um, is, of course, not the quote, great equalizer for the majority of um, BIPOC students. White households with a bachelor degree or a postgraduate education, such as a PhD, an MD, or a JD, are more than three times as wealthy as Black households with the same education. Um, on average, a Black household with a college-educated head has less wealth than a family, a white family, whose head did not even obtain a high school diploma. So just to get to the level of a white family with a high school diploma, um, a black household has to, or the, at least the household head has to get a college a degree. Uh, a college degree. Um, financing loans to individual students, which is how we decided to do this, how we decided to support higher education um, as, uh, at the federal level, is not the only way we could have done this. This is a crisis created by congressional policy choices and exacerbated over time by other choices, including the one that the ones that have made student loans very hard to discharge in bankruptcy, um, the ones that uh, eliminated the statutes of limitation on federal student loans, and the choices to permit the federal government to seize income tax refunds, including the earned income tax credit and Social Security. All of those things um, allegedly not happening right this second because of the pandemic, although there's <laughs> that may not actually be true. They're not supposed to be happening anyway right now. So how do we fix this? Uh, well, I mean, just like all of the other problems we need, at, not to be glib, but big structural change. Um, there's really no other way. This is just, this is much bigger than higher education financing. Um, in, in the article, we, you know, we call for reparations, perhaps through baby bonds, um, as proposed by professors Derek Hamilton and William Darity Jr. But we also need other changes, uh, structural changes in housing, criminal justice, employment law, voting rights, and just basically uh, the economy. Um, a proper remedy for this harm would be specifically targeted to redress past and ongoing wrongs incurred, particularly because of racism and racist policies. Um, and uh, you know, we can't just address the issues of student debt in isolation, but race conscious legislation like this would not just require a, a Congress and a president willing to entertain it. It would also require essentially a different Supreme Court, given their hostility to um, the, the majority of the members hostility to towards efforts to remedy broader structural disparities. Um, so uh, in the article and in general, just being pragmatic, we, you know, we sort of but we call for a bigger change, but ultimately, uh, you know, sort of go narrower. And what if we did try to just fix uh, the, the student debt problem? Well, that's that problem still needs at least two different fixes. One for the people who have debt right now and the other one, um, you know, just reframing, rethinking, redoing how we fund higher education. Um, and so for the current debtors, um, you know, there's there's a number of plans that have been proposed, including uh, I think the current uh, Biden plan is for a 10,000, you know, which is like a coronavirus thing with the 10,000 um, in forgiveness and thousand dollars in student loan forgiveness automatic to everyone. Uh, there were much higher um, uh, student debt forgiveness proposals. Some of them and the ones that uh, Professor Glader and I favor in the article are ones that uh, would phase out after a certain amount of income. Um, this is not the only way. Uh, in fact, it's not. It's really not a, the, the best way to reduce the wealth gap, but it would reduce the wealth gap um, if we uh, did it right. Um, so debt forgiveness is important, but a one time you know, forgiveness program does very little for uh, future students facing the prospect of debt. Um, and in fact, it kind of creates weird incentives for students thinking like, oh, they're just going to be another forgiveness. And, and so they're, uh, it just really isn't, uh, it should not be a one off thing. Um, a new way for the federal government uh, to support higher education uh, is, is what we need. The answer is not to give up. The answer is not to say, oh, well, well, we don't know how to do this. So we're just going to step back. Uh, but it's actually to put our money where, where our mouth is. And instead of asking students to take a risky bet that we actually know will f is more likely to fail for Black and Latino students and you know immigrant students and certain uh, groups, 
uh, we should support institutions that allow students to attend, particularly for free, cost free, not just tuition free, cost free, um, in uh, particularly for the neediest of students. Um, and so in our paper, we actually argue for a sharp expansion of public funding from both the federal and individual state governments who have also dropped the ball on this. Um, and secondly, we explore a sort of more modest proposal to change the existing student aid structure. Um, at the end of the day, though, we have to start with uh, acknowledging that debt was the wrong tool to fund higher education access. And probably more broadly, that debt is the wrong tool to fund a lot of things that have to do with individuals, um, just probably all of them, really. Um, and uh, there's really great work by Abby Atkinson uh, on this um, uh, debt as a social provision, really great article. Um, we should correct that mistake by forgiving all or at least most student loan debt, and we must forge a path forward where we put our money work. Um, it matters and ensure that we enable all of our citizens to fulfill their potential. That's it for me. I think we didn't have a little bit of time. So if people have questions, we can type them into the chat or raise your uh, hand and we can call on you. Trying to see if there are any questions. And if there aren't right now, I'm happy to talk about policing to use up the rest of our time, but let me just see. Are there any questions, Michael? Anyone's hands up? Uh, not at the moment. Um, okay, let, well, let me know because I'm happy to stop, but I'll, uh, I'll make some brief comments then on uh, policing. So, oh, sorry, we do have one oh, hand up, um, Anthony. Is, can I ask aloud? Is that is that the idea? Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you everyone uh, for your time and for doing this. Um, if I were to put into one sentence, uh, you know, some of the more general, a more general theme of, of uh, these presentations, I would, I would have to say, okay, there is a, uh, there's an inherent link between certain operations of capitalism and white supremacy, right? So my question, I guess, is, uh, I seem to be noticing a lot of democratically elect, uh, Democrats uh, holding local office specifically, uh, as an example, in my hometown and, and where I attend law school in Pittsburgh, Mayor recently tweeted about the alt left as as uh, as a uh, a general um, dissuasion for why he you know uh, uh, should garner more votes from the other side of the aisle. I think was the presumed idea. Um, why is that a contra Why is my generalized sentence even for someone who thinks that it strikes me as a controversial idea? And how can we move uh, towards equity when that? Converse, that part of the conversation is something people are more or less unwilling to entertain. I just, if I can just jump in, I think people are more willing to entertain now. I'm at least, and more willing to entertain sort of fixes that I think would have been unthinkable a few years ago. So we're definitely not there. Yeah, but I, I mean, I really do think at the very least on even things that happened, you know, that just moved not along racial lines, so we're still not 100% there, but even just things that help poor people, <laughs> we're in a uh, much better um, place now than we were, you know, two years ago. Yeah, like talking in the student loan context, just talking about forgiveness in public in, you know, among large groups of people that seemed it's still probably radical, but that seemed really radical a few years ago. Um, yeah, so I, I would agree with that, and 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 uh, I guess the way I would I would try to start to answer the question uh, is is to, to think about the the myths that we live by. Uh, so I've done some writing about actually about intellectual property and and sort of uh, social myths uh, because we all have these uh, tropes and expectations that we're we're raised with and that we live by. Um, uh, you know, like honesty is the best policy and all, all men are created equal and, uh, you know, uh, you know, hard work is rewarded. Um, and, and we know that, that those aren't true, <laughs> or, or at least maybe they're, they're only partly true. Uh, and, and I think what you are identifying is, you know, sort of very, very pervasive, uh, myths about, uh, the capitalist society and about the uh, the way that the free market works. 
Um, and and we need we need some new stories. We need we need some new narratives. Um, I think uh, Professor Jimenez is right that we are beginning to uh, generate uh, some of those uh, some of those stories and some of those understandings. Um, but the stories that we have have traditionally lived by um, uh, are, are not working for us. Uh, and and so I guess my answer would be that it, it, it's time it's time for some some new narratives and, and some new uh, some new myths because uh, uh, I think you're identifying that capitalism is very much like a religion, right? People believe in it very fervently, despite the fact that there's not any good evidence that it actually works. Thank you so much. I'll move to the next question. I see uh, Faisal Chowdhury. Faisal Chowdhury. Might okay. be muted. I can't see all the participants, but let me um, move to the. Okay, I'm going to move to the next person. Um, it looks like it's F. Badawi. Yes, hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for participating in this uh, extremely insightful panel. Uh, my question is specifically to uh, Professor DiMento in the context of uh, implicit uh, bias and the feedback from your students. I found it very striking that uh, you had um, re requested that feedback from your students, and uh, I found it to be a very interesting exercise in communication, which would be key in all of this issue. So my question is, uh, what compelled you to do that? What did you learn from it? And if you were trying to reach out to colleagues who would be in the same I guess, age and demographic bracket as yourself, how would you convince them to try to uh, uh, create some sort of similar medium of discussion with their students? What would you tell them to do what you did? Thank you. I think you need to unmute Pretty yourself. Muted. Hey, Michael, can you unmute uh, Joe Demento? Yep, he's unmuted. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, the simple and um, quick answer is I wanted help. Uh, I wanted uh, perspectives from uh, people who have had very different experiences than I have had. Uh, as I mentioned, I've taught this course forever. Uh, race has been a, a part of it, but not at the level that I think it should be addressed. Uh, so that was part of it. It was easy to ask, uh, and my my students uh, this year are, are, are truly engaged, and I knew I would get some very good assistance. With regard to um, our colleagues, um, at least here, we don't seem to have that problem of needing to convince people. That it's, a, it's a community that is, is getting involved, uh, has been involved many for, for a long time. Uh, perhaps my other colleagues could, could chime in. Uh, to me, it was a natural. It worked well. I was uh, so impressed by the responses, but the responses in class were equally um, uh, helpful. I, I guess I guess I would respond to Joe a, a little bit. Um, some of this is is, is discipline dependent, and and Joe, as he said, is a very interdisciplinary scholar who has uh, worked in different uh, different areas. Uh, you know, my, my background is is in the physical sciences, where uh, graduate students uh, are considered to be junior colleagues, uh, and it would not be at all unusual uh, to do the kind of thing that Joe did in in a uh, uh, physical science setting and and ask for help and ask for input from uh, students because they are learning and training to uh, to be scientists themselves. Um, we we have a little bit of a hierarchy problem in in law schools uh, and and I think Joe is right that uh, uh, at least at UC Irvine uh, it's, it's not as bad as it might be some places. Um, but I think part of it is 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 learning uh, what some other disciplines already know in, in the legal uh, education environment, which is. Uh, that you are dealing with junior colleagues, people who are going to be uh, professionals, uh, and that uh, uh, part of uh, part of what you do and part of what they do uh, is the, is exactly the kind of exchange that, that Joe asked for, uh, because that's what that, that's how colleagues talk to each other. That's how they should talk to each other. Thank you. 
So I will read a question uh, from the chat, which I think is a perfect uh, closing uh, question, and I'll ask each of you to to chime in. Um, so how does the work that you do fit into UC Irvine's larger efforts to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion amongst our student body? Anyone want to jump in? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, you know, I think um, the, the the law school, what we're trying to do is um, to um, not take sort of the standard narratives as Dan and, and um, Joe and Dolly and uh, others were saying, not take the standard narratives for granted. So if we're talking about property or contracts that we're going to um, promote these values of diversity and inclusion. And, and I don't see this as an add on. I see this as not committing malpractice. Um, I think we are committing malpractice if we do not teach property and as a, you know, and, and through the idea of race, because how can you understand the way that the world works without understanding the history of how these things came about? And Dan, you know, saying, and Joe, you know, if you're not, I think Dan was saying, if, if you're not if you don't see the implications of race in the subject that you teach, then you haven't dug far enough. And and, and I think the burden is on us to um, to find that in our field and to teach it. And I, I think that this is what we're trying to do, um, among other things uh, here. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I'm just I've been here for two years and I'm just really I'm, I'm happy to um, I'm really happy to be among uh, these colleagues because we've had these conversations. Um, I mean, it, for the past two years that I've been here on a regular basis, whether or not there was anything in particular, um, you know, calling everybody to have these kind of conversations and, uh, you know, the latest ones have focused on how do we bring uh, these issues to bear in all of our classes and in some of our because I teach. Uh, commercial law um, and, you know, tax and other kinds of sort of financial subjects that aren't traditionally thought of as well. Some people haven't have, they haven't seen the light um, in, in some ways, but we are, uh, you know, doing that work together in some cases where there where there isn't as much uh, research as, as, you know, uh, Dan is doing and, and Joe and, and Marissa are doing. And um, I think, uh, you know, I, I just feel very supported in wanting to in, in anything that I want to do in this area, which I think is um, by our faculty and uh, staff and students. Yeah, so I, I think I, I think I'd have a kind of a two part answer to that. Um, one is the very famous story that Lauren Isley uh, used to tell called the Star Thrower, uh, which is a story that he was walking along the beach after a storm and he saw a man on the, on the beach and who was uh, picking up starfish that had been blown out of the ocean and were going to die uh, on the beach and was throwing them back into the ocean uh, to try and save them. And, and he said to the guy, he said, you know, the beach is too big. You can't possibly save all the starfish. Uh, and, and the man said, no, but I can save this one. And he, and he threw it back in the ocean. Um, and, and I kind of had the same feeling. You know, Dalia uh, Jimenez described all of the structural changes that we would have to, to make just to solve the problem of, of racism in, in student debt, right? Uh, and and the, the problem is too big for any one of us. So, so I feel kind of like uh, with my colleagues, you know, that, that, that we're doing a jigsaw puzzle uh, and everybody's trying to, get, to help put it together. And, and I have a, a, a piece, right? Uh, you know, I, I've sort of looked and I've, I found a piece in my area and, and I can figure out where that fits and that will help give us the big picture and, and give us the big solution. I can't find the big solutions myself. I can only find it cooperating with my colleagues. And as Joe Demento said, co cooperating with my students. Uh, so it's, so it, it, it's jigsaw puzzling as far as I'm concerned. I have a piece and I, and I wanna try and work with my colleagues to, to fit that together into the big solution. It does help to have such a supportive administration, including our Dean, who I wish had talked more, but you can hear much of what she has to say through other outlets. Thank you so much. And we are almost out of time. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us. I want to especially thank Michael Whiteman for helping us yes. run this session today. Thank you so much, Michael. And as all of you um, can see, we take these issues extremely seriously across the entire curriculum here at UC Irvine, and we will continue to do this important work um, towards racial equity and fighting against anti-Blackness and racism. 
I hope that all of you learned as much as I did from my remarkable colleagues. And thank you again for joining us today. <laughs>